This November, for the first time in more than a decade, Vermonters will select someone to fill an open seat for governor. These are two pros. These are two guys who've been in the business for a long time. Capable individuals who are, you know, will take the state the next, you know, the, the next decade. Two men, products of the same generation, both longtime public servants, want to be your choice. He's very committed. He's very intense. Whatever he gets into, he's totally dedicated to. There's not a mean bone in his body. He's a, he's a very uh, generous and thoughtful person. How have their past experiences prepared them for the job ahead? He loved to read. Oh, he read the world books, you know, from cover to cover. <laughs> he was very bright, and he really had a great thirst for knowledge awful early. Jim Douglas and Doug Racine, Vermont's Choice, 2002. This program was made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. Three-term Lieutenant Governor Douglas Allen Racine was born in Burlington, October 7, 1952, the middle son of Willie and Annette. The middle guy is always different, and he's a middle guy. <laughs> he's a politician, he's different. <laughs> yeah. The three Racine boys, Michael, Doug, and Tom, were all born two years apart. My mother loved my three boys, or our three boys, and she'd say, I wish I could live long enough to see what Doug's going to do. Uh, she, she could sense something in him. It's strange, isn't it? I think, too, when she would come over to the house, especially after her father passed away, Doug might be on the floor with his legs crossed like an Indian style and going through world book after world book after world book. We used to have to push him outside to get active. He loved to read. Oh, he'd read the world books, you know, from cover to cover. <laughs> Racine's parents met while working together at Goss Dodge, where Annette was the bookkeeper and Willie a mechanic. We didn't have too much money, but we, I, we brought them up th saying that whatever we had, we shared. That's the way they were brought up. You shared what you had. The Racines raised their three sons in the south end of Burlington and eventually established a Jeep dealership. They say they worked hard, but also made time for fun. And we had the break by going skiing, and uh, just enjoyable. Most of the time we went to Stowe, but other times we'd go to other areas, but Stowe is our favorite. Yeah, we had a small Jeep with a soft top, just about no heat inside. <laughs> I think that helped a lot, too, to keep the family together, because I know every so often that subject comes up. Wasn't that great? They talk about what? where we skied and the trails and what that. Doug went to Burlington High School. He had an affinity for numbers and did well in class, but says he was shy. And I did not like getting up in front of class. Uh, I didn't like when we had to memorize poems in elementary school and get up and recite them. Uh, I was uh, and, and interpersonally shy too, a, a pretty quiet uh, person. I've had to uh, push on myself to be involved in politics. I've, Obviously, I've gotten past it. I can go out there now and, and politic and, and speak, uh, but it, it, it took a while to get to that point. Despite the shyness, he belonged to many clubs and organizations, as did his opponent, Jim Douglas. Four-term state treasurer James Holly Douglas grew up in East Longmeadow, Massachusetts, a quiet community just south of Springfield. He was a teacher's delight. <laughs> He, he liked school and he was an easy student because uh, everything was interesting to him. Born on July 21st, 1951, Jim is the oldest of three, two years older than sister Judy and seven years senior to brother John. He was very bright and he really had a great thirst for knowledge awful early. <laughs> Remember we had to get an encyclopedia yeah. when he was five years old? <laughs> set of encyclopedias and because he really wanted to know. Jim's father Bob worked at Sears and his mother Cora became a teacher after the children were grown. According to his parents, Jim was also quite shy, but they say he blossomed in ninth grade when called upon to be a master of ceremonies at the last minute. And so uh, he, he did a beautiful job and in just a few hours. And they were absolutely amazed, so then they started asking him to, for, to do all these things. And I think he gained the confidence then that he could do it. His parents say he always went his own way. And he always 
thought for himself. I mean, he, uh, uh, he didn't really care what all the others were doing and so forth. He just, you know, if, if he believed in something, he did it. And it's true. Like yeah. When the long hair was in, he still stuck to the old yeah, standard I'm, haircut. I kept saying, won't you let it grow <laughs> a little? You're standing out. <laughs> it's the way I like it. It's the way I want to do it. When time allowed, the Douglases vacationed at a family camp in Maine. They all enjoy swimming and, and the water sports. And uh, yes, he used to come up a lot. But as I said before, he was on the older end. So that he, had, had to go to work. he went to work in the summers. Didn't have to, but... After graduating as president of his senior class, Jim decided to go to Middlebury College and became a Russian major. Well, at that time, uh, there was a lot of concern about the Cold War and uh, what the future of the world was going to be. It was a very, very tense time. Uh, uh, the Soviet Union was a, a second superpower, uh, viewed in many respects as equivalent to the United States, and I thought it was uh, important to know about our major international adversary. He also got involved with the college radio station, eventually becoming news director. Chris Graff, Vermont bureau chief for the Associated Press, remembers the first time they met. It was the fall of 1971. I was a freshman just entering Middlebury, and Jim was the news director of WRMC-FM. And uh, I was sitting on Proctor Terrace, and Jim came out, and he was looking for volunteers. He wanted to provide live coverage of the funeral of Senator Winston Prouty. They were going to have a funeral in Newport, and I doubt any other station, commercial or non-commercial in the state, was going to provide live coverage of the Prouty funeral. But Jim thought it was important to do, and so I volunteered, and that's how I got into the news business. Jim also worked at WHYN in Springfield, while home on breaks from Middlebury. I've seen a lot of reporters come and go here at the station, and uh, Jim is one of those reporters I distinctly remember. Um, he was a real great colleague to work with, an intelligent guy, and had a, a, a real unique ability, I think, to, uh, to grasp news, factual information, and uh, you know, do an effective job, even at a relatively young age. He was just out of high school and college. Uh, but I think he had a maturity beyond his years. But I think uh, what I remember most about him is that he was a genuinely nice guy. While Jim was working at WHYN and going to Middlebury, Doug Racine left Vermont to enroll at Princeton. I did want to leave Vermont for a while. I wanted to, uh, to experience another part of the world. And it was hard. There were times that I didn't like uh, Princeton. It was uh, academically a whole lot more challenging uh, than Burlington High School had been. And my first semester was very difficult. I picked up my first D uh, when I was at Princeton and uh, in college level physics. It was, uh, it was very tough. Uh, and so it was, it was the challenge. But um, again, I'm, I'm a, somewhat of a persistent person. And I said, I'm, gonna, I'm going to see if I can do this. And, uh, and I was able to uh, survive it and found courses that I really enjoyed. Doug majored in politics and worked at the dining hall. There, he made good friends like Jim Paglarini, who today heads Twin Cities Public Television in Minnesota. I think Doug was actually my very first boss when I walked in the door at the Princeton Dining Hall back in 1971 or 72. But he was a serious guy. He was serious about running the dining hall. He sort of, you know, well, it wasn't that difficult to be a, a student manager at the dining hall, but he was a good boss. Besides meeting Paglarini at the dining hall, he also met his future wife, Robbie Harold. Well, initially, you know, he seemed really shy and very vulnerable. And of course, he was really cute. Um, and we just got talking, and we didn't stop. He's very committed. He's very intense. Whatever he gets into, he's totally dedicated to. Um, and that's something I've noticed about him from day one. He's very serious about what he does. Um, and really very driven by his values and beliefs. Robbie and Doug married in 1977, shortly after graduating from Princeton. They eloped to St. Thomas and then lived briefly in Washington, D.C., before returning to Vermont. Eventually, they grew apart and divorced in 1995. They remain on good terms. Fairness is big with him. Fairness is really, really big with him. That's, that probably gets him more energized than anything, his perception of something being unjust or unfair. After graduating from Middlebury in 1972, Jim Douglas had some news for his parents. He said, I'm going to stay in Vermont. And I said, you are? And he said, yeah. And he said, I just love it up there. After college, Jim worked in Middlebury at radio station WFAD 
and as executive director of United Way of Addison County. He met his wife Dorothy at church and then later at the dentist's office where she still works as an assistant. Usually I'm about the last person to find out about those things. I probably didn't know about it until they got the wedding invitation. <laughs> uh, I've been following her orders to br brush and floss ever since. He's a very loving and devoting husband and, and father to our two sons. He's very honest and sincere. He's very passionate about what he believes in and great sense of humor. They raised two boys, Matt, recently graduating with high honors from Worcester Polytechnical Institute, and Andrew is a finance major at Bentley College. Jim and Dorothy still live in East Middlebury, where Jim commutes 47 miles each way to the treasurer's office in Montpelier, in a neon with no air conditioning. I'm a cheapskate. I'm uh, thrifty. I'm frugal with my own resources. I, I think he was a very astute as a youngster. He realized when we were first married and had the kids that the money wasn't growing on trees and he could see us sort of economizing and I think this is carried on so he still economizes. Besides serving as Lieutenant Governor, Doug Racine works with his two brothers at the family's Jeep dealership now on Shelburne Road. Brother Tom says he's a big help even though he's not around much. Good. So you're still putting two people up here? No, one at a time. Because we only have six people and someone's no. always off, so. Yeah. We still draw on Doug. Um, we've always made that comment in our dealership when we make some large decisions for the company. Uh, all three of us are involved. Um, so yeah, conflicts can come up, but we can also feed off of each other's expertise. Um, I like the sales end of it. Michael really likes the, the nitty gritty, the, the service and parts end of it. And Doug keeps us focused on all the numbers. And uh, drawing off of each other's strengths, I think, has helped this business grow over the years. And, and uh, it, it pleases our parents, too, that we can continue the legacy. It is. In it fact, the parents good. still come by for lunch whenever they are in town. Everyone who comes here puts on five, ten pounds. Or <laughs> it seems to be a normal thing to do. We usually call the dealership and I, uh, Michael or Tom or Lorraine, the office manager, and I says, are we eating in today? They say, yes, okay, we'll be over. When he eats, he eats in we just love to be with them. He likes it. That means a lot to him because he spent his whole life there. I spent some of mine, but it's not that important to me, but it is to him. But it's important that she was there with me. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Doug does not have much time for family lunches these days. When he does get a minute, he likes to bike and hike. He continues to live in the Richmond home he's had since 1977. Uh, kind of a private person. Uh, so there are times where I just like being here uh, at my home, in my house, and just have my, uh, my quiet time uh, to myself. Uh, but I also enjoy uh, the po politics and I enjoy campaigning. The woman in Doug's life is Julie Munter, who he says he's been friends with for the past 10 years. So we have two men, one who left Vermont to go to college but returned, one who came here to college and stayed. Both bright, about the same age, the products of hard-working middle-class families, both anxious to become the next governor of Vermont. Their paths after college continued on in similar directions. Something happened in here. But it is I shall resign the presidency exactly effective there. at noon tomorrow. There's a man with a it was another time, a mid-presidential scandal and a divisive war, when Jim Douglas and Doug Racine launched careers in politics. 1972, with the ink barely dry on his Middlebury degree, Douglas abandoned the idea of broadcasting and instead won election to the Vermont House of Representatives. I was 21 when I first came to this chamber, but there were three members younger than I. He rose quickly into leadership positions, in an odd twist, seated next to another representative with ambition. He was a Republican whip, and I was Democratic whip. And uh, both of us were on the House Appropriations Committee, uh, which uh, Emory Hibbard uh, chaired. So when I got notes from the pages, I sort of put my arm around the note so that he wouldn't... <laughs> 
look over and try to read it. And I think he did the same thing. Doug Racine was content exploring the mechanics of politics. Fresh out of Princeton, he volunteered on Patrick Leahy's first U.S. Senate campaign in 1974. I wasn't sure where, where I was going after college, but I was interested in working a, a campaign. Uh, and if, uh, if he uh, hadn't won that campaign, uh, I think I would have headed off to law school. So, uh, but, uh, so maybe Pat Leahy saved the world from yet another attorney. Racine got noticed the next year accepting a job on Leahy's Washington staff in defense research. Ducky and I looked about 13, uh, but here was a kid with a brain that was amazing, very, very good intellect, and extraordinarily hard work. Leahy would become Racine's mentor, though the protege would soon return home, still working from the shadows. Being a rather uh, quiet and shy person, I never envisioned myself out knocking on doors and making speeches and running for office. Jim Douglas felt no such hesitation. Still in his 20s and Republican leader, he challenged House Speaker Tim O'Connor and lost. But Douglas caught the eye of the man he calls his mentor, the late Governor Richard Snelling, who asked him to join the executive branch. He was the, the role model. Uh, he, he knew how to do the job. Uh, he did it well. Um, he was a great influence on me, and I, I carry a lot of what I learned from him with me today. Former U.S. Representative Dick Mallory served as Snelling's chief of staff. Uh, he knew Jim's uh, intelligence, his basic honesty, his integrity, and he knew that his character uh, was beyond reproach. Energized by his Snelling experience, Douglas soon launched a campaign for Secretary of State in 1980, winning in spite of his taste for plaid. As a struggling young family trying to get by at that time, uh, I certainly didn't... Uh, didn't get too many Brooks Brothers suits. Two years later, Racine won his first election, a seat in the state Senate representing Chittenden County. I recall knocking on doors, particularly in Burlington, and people would say, you know, you UVM students, you college students, you shouldn't be running for office until you get out of school. And, you... and it was a great opening for me to say, well, actually, I'm, uh, I'm uh, 29, 30 years old. Uh, and uh, I'm not just out of college. And I worked for Senator Leahy, and I helped uh, Madeline Cunin with, with her campaigns for lieutenant governor. Uh, I've had this, this kind of experience and I'm part of the family business now. So I always use that as an opening to, well, yeah, here's the experience I have. So uh, I'm not the 19-year-old kid you think I am. Uh, but I didn't mind looking. Racine found another mentor in Phil Hoff, an ex-governor elected to the Senate that year. Yet Racine's shyness was still palpable here negotiating over whether to raise the 18-year-old drinking age. I've talked to some of the uh, uh, senators representing uh, some of the northern counties, and they're concerned about the Canadian border. Racine tried to improve his public speaking, gaining his footing with complex work over the budget, new children's programs, and environmental regulations, spending a decade in the Senate. He has what you might call a quiet ambition. Uh, he sees a goal and uh, he sticks to it. Jim Douglas spent 10 years as Secretary of State, overseeing Vermont's archives, licensing, and elections. I've reached a decision and, and will begin a campaign for the Senate. Surprising many in 92 with a long shot bid against Senator Lake. Per month, then Social Security recipients are getting $19 a month. Oh, sorry, $19 and, and two cents. Leahy had to scramble to defeat uh, Jim Douglas in a, in a much tighter contest than ever anticipated. Hi, how are you? Racine looked to climb higher too. On his second try, he won a tight race for Lieutenant Governor in 1996. The economy was surging, though two Supreme Court decisions would force divisive debate in Montpelier, leading to Act 60 and civil unions. Racine pushed for both. Douglas, meantime, was serving as state treasurer, managing billions of retirement dollars, but well away from the spotlight. I will not be a candidate for governor. Last year, when Governor Howard Dean announced he would step down, Racine and Douglas said this was their time. To the next governor of the state of Vermont, Jim Douglas. He's not a mean bone in his body. He's a, he's a very 
a generous and thoughtful person, but, and he has a remarkable sense of humor. I'm not surprised that he's always wanted to, he's, he's never called himself a politician, always a statesman. He's always felt that he wanted to help people. I want them to think of me as someone uh, who is extremely dedicated to the responsibilities that I've been given, uh, someone who uh, assumes them and carries them out in a serious way, but who is still an average guy, someone who, uh, uh, just like every other Vermonter, has uh, had a mortgage and uh, raised kids and paid for braces and college and gone through all the experiences that most Vermont families have. I ask you and I ask all Vermonters for the honor and privilege to lead this great state. Thank you very much. Sure, people say you're biased, but we know him pretty well. We know he's honest. I know. We know that he has a feeling for the working people. You know, he's uh, matured, and uh, I think he's been practicing or rehearsing for this role of governor uh, most of his life. Do you feel destined this year? I'm not sure destined is the right word. I feel like I've got a wonderful opportunity. These are two pros. These are two guys who've been in the business for a long time. Capable individuals who are, you know, will take the state the next, you know, the next decade. Because once you're elected in Vermont, you pretty much stay elected in Vermont. I'm Doug Racine. And I want to be your governor! I have a vision for Vermont's future, a vision of hope and opportunity. Both campaigns share similar strategies, get the message out, and reach as many undecided voters as possible. I'm talking in, in this campaign about how we go about creating jobs. That is the number one priority of the next governor of the state of Vermont. But the time for talk, the time for studies, the time for task forces is over. Time for action is now. Both have enlisted young men with some national political experience to manage their Vermont campaigns. Tom Hughes runs the Racine campaign out of office space shared with Democrats in Burlington. He is a University of Vermont graduate and Norwich native who worked for Dukakis and Clinton Gore in Vermont and then moved on to Vice President Gore's team at the national level. He's also served as executive director of the Vermont Democratic Party. I worked with Doug uh, in 1998 on his race against uh, Barbara Snelling, and uh, uh, we got to know one another very well on that race. He called me up uh, about uh, a year ago and asked me if I would consider working for him on this campaign, and I said I would be delighted to. Over at Douglas Campaign Headquarters two blocks away, Neil Lunderville is the man in charge. Like Tom, he is also a Vermont native and former executive director of his party. All right, <laughs> success. <laughs> yeah, I, of course, I knew Jim through all the contacts through that organization. And as this campaign began to get ramped up, um, we kind of had one of those moments where we found each other. And uh, uh, it just seemed to fit and went from there. Both campaigns have their share of volunteers. At the Racine camp, former state representative Sally Fox is the policy director. I do a lot of background research on issues. I write policy papers. I have been spending a great deal of time working on the hundreds of surveys um, that the campaign gets to determine what Doug's positions are on certain issues. I answer the phone. I, uh, I'm, I pretty much do anything that's asked of me. Both camps continue to be staffed mostly by Vermonters. Both Republicans and Democrats say they are getting national support, but maintain the campaign is being run here, not by folks in Washington. They leave us to be pretty independent. Uh, they view this uh, as a great opportunity for a Republican pickup, uh, and they, they more or less tr trust the locals on the ground here to uh, direct the campaign in a fashion that's most appropriate for Vermont. In the closing weeks of the campaign, Polls show a large percentage of voters still to be undecided. However, both sides say they are confident. I am happy with the way things are going. I've been ahead in the polls uh, through the summer. Uh, I've been raising the money uh, that I need. I've been getting out there with my message, and people are, are curious. Uh, they're really interested. They're picking the first new governor uh, in 11 years. And I feel like the message is getting through to people. 
It's quite intense, um, but uh, it's still fun to get around and, and see the people of this state. Most of them have been very, very cordial and, and uh, interested in hearing what I have to say and uh, interested in telling me what's on their minds. So two men, 150, 151, one Democrat, one Republican, each with two siblings, the products of happy, hardworking parents. Both grew up in and continue to live in modest homes. Both were very successful in school. Both were shy, both voracious readers, neither one much into team sports. Both passionate about what they believe in and dedicated to their respective parties. Both want to be Vermont's choice for governor. seems like I've been at it for a long time. Uh, people sometimes come up to me and ask, uh, hey, when's the campaign going to start? And I say, gosh, I've been doing this 24-7 for months. The first time I ran for the legislature, I, I lost that race and uh, didn't discourage me. And I came back two years later and got elected. The uh, first time I ran for lieutenant governor, I lost that race and was persistent and came back two years later. And I'm really trying to break the pattern. This program was made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting.